Hi, everyone. Welcome to the event Confronting the Threat of the Far Right. This is being sponsored by the National Political Education Committee in DSA. Um, I'm a member and my name is Amy Mepham. I'm also on the steering committee for the uh, for NPEC. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We are really excited to get this event started. Um, just first wanted to thank our uh, panelists, John Huntington, Nancy McLean, and Bill Fletcher for joining us. And they're gonna be speaking in uh, just a few moments. Um, would also like to thank organizers, Bill Barclay, David Kotz, and Jerry Harris. So thank you so much for putting this event together. Um, just to give you a quick rundown of how things will go this evening, we are going to begin with uh, uh, presentations from each of the panelists. Uh, they will speak for 15 minutes. I'll introduce the panelists uh, each before they speak. And then after that, we will have a Q&A session. Please note that we will be, um, we ask you as uh, participants to list your question in the Q&A function on Zoom. We are not enabling the chat for this event. Um, and if you could please direct your question to a specific speaker, that would be wonderful. So we have, after the uh, speakers are, have concluded, we'll have a, a chance for a Q&A session. I also want to remind everyone that this event is being recorded. And I think that's uh, all, so we can go ahead and get started with our first speaker. And just thanks again, everyone, for, for being here. Um, okay, I will get started with uh, John S. Huntington. John S. Huntington is a professor of history at Houston Community College in Houston, Texas. A native, a native of Georgetown, Texas, he spent a few years working in K through 12 education before joining the college ranks. Dr. Huntington's first book, Far Right Vanguard, The Radical Roots of Modern Conservatism, examines the history and influence of right-wing radicalism in 20th century American politics and society. His writing has appeared in scholarly journals such as the Western Historical Quarterly and Radical Americas, and he has also published in public-facing outlets like the Washington Post, Politico, and The Atlantic. Thank you very much. Go ahead, John. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm so happy to be here speaking before the Democratic Socialists of America, and I truly do appreciate the invitation. Um, so as the lead off speaker, I'm going to kind of be walking through the origins of the modern far right. Um, I first started reading and about and researching conservatism back in 2014 when I was a grad student at the University of Houston. Um, and back then, most history books, in my estimation, undervalued the far right as a political catalyst. Um, even when I started studying it, people even questioned my choice of studying the far right in general. Um, when I was shopping my book in 2016, one editor told me that there was a, quote unquote, this is his word, a fatigue around conservatism, and he wondered how the far right mattered at all in the age of Obama. Um, but after Trump's election in 2016, of course, um, scholars started revisiting the history of conservatism. Rick Perlstein, a famous scholar of conservatism, wrote a retrospective noting that historians held a rough consensus about the rise of modern American conservatism, and he said that that consensus told a respectable tale. You know, this narrative argued that conservatives forged mainstream respectability by ostracizing the radicals in their midst. Um, historians had essentially created a mythology wherein conservative intellectuals, you know, guarded their ideological flock while, you know, uh, by, from intrusions of far-right, you know, crackpots, while titanic political figures like Ronald Reagan guided conservatism to political victories. But this respectable narrative laundered the history of American conservatism um, by casting the far right as a bit player or a troubling aberration rather than the base of the movement. Now, the reality was that the line dividing the far right from the conservative mainstream was often blurred to the point of illegibility. Mid-century analysts Benjamin Epstein and Arnold Forster of the Anti-Defamation League observed that the two factions are difficult to separate at times, particularly when they sit at the same rallies and applaud the same ideas. Indeed, the far-right movement grew out of the same ideological seedbed that nourished the conservative mainstream. You know, as my book argues, the far-right formed the vanguard of the movement. And over the course of 60 years, the conspiracy theories, the nativism, the white supremacist rhetoric, and the radical libertarianism promoted by the mid-century far right slowly metastasized until it consumed the Republican Party. You know, but that begs the question, uh, you know, where did this movement come from? Like, what are its roots? What are its origins? And there are perhaps multiple answers to that question. You know, we could go all the way back to the early republic and consider the American founders' antipathy towards mass democracy or their permissive attitude toward, if not outright participation in, chattel slavery. You know, the founders created the Senate and the Supreme Court 
both of which serve as modern day hammer locks against democratic procedure. Um, certainly the legacy of the Confederacy bears you know, uh, consideration here when thinking of the history of the far right. Coming from Texas, I can attest to the power of the lost cause. You know, take a drive in the countryside and you'll occasionally drive by large rural estates you know, with the old stars and bars and a Trump 2024 flag flapping in the breeze. You know, but when, when considering the far right's influence upon modern conservatism, to me, the natural origin point is the Great Depression and Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Roosevelt inherited the Depression from Herbert Hoover. You know, the year was 1933. Banks were collapsing uh, by, the, by the thousands and millions of people were out of work. The Dust Bowl ripped through the Great Plains, pushing hundreds of thousands of migrants west in search of jobs, food, you know, the basics of survival. Um, a specter of desperation truly haunted the American landscape. And so Roosevelt's solution to the ravages of the Great Depression was the New Deal, a, a bundle of spending programs designed to lift those millions of unemployed out of poverty. Creating jobs through federal programs was just a piece of this, right? That was an important component, but just as important was the willingness to empower unions and also to tamp down the excesses of capital. In fact, Roosevelt took direct aim at capital in his inaugural address, um, asserting that the this is his, these are his words, that the practices of the unscrupulous money changers had been rejected by the hearts and minds of men. Now, in the popular imagination, Roosevelt and the New Deal staved off the worst of the Depression, brought government power to bear for the benefit of the people, and laid the foundation for a popular liberal state. From a left-wing perspective, the New Deal was far from perfect. You know, Roosevelt had to cut deals with the powerful bloc of segregationist Southern Democrats, which meant that non-whites often struggled to access the New Deal's financial largesse. Union busting continued under Roosevelt's uh, watch. And furthermore, and most importantly, probably from a left-wing uh, critic, Roosevelt's policies sought to defend capitalism rather than tearing it down. As Marxist historian Michael Parenti argued, Roosevelt was the guardian of capitalism who oversaw what Parenti called the reconstruction of the all-bourgeois alliance. Social democracy did not, in fact, usher in a new era of socialism. However, where the left spied a missed opportunity or a careful maintenance of the status quo, the right saw Armageddon. To the right, to the far right especially, the New Deal was a veiled attempt at communist revolution. A group called the American Liberty League, um, which was basically a group bankrolled by wealthy industrialists at the time, called the New Deal, a these are, this word, these are their words, a vicious combination of fascism, socialism, and communism altogether. Another far-right organization, the Jeffersonian Democrats, took a nativist angle by deriding the New Deal as alien and foreign and inimical to America and Americanism. Southern conservatives worried the New Deal might disrupt the nation's carefully drawn color lines. One Texas rancher lamented that federal jobs programs created, and these are his words, an army of shiftless Negroes and aliens at the expense of all of us, implying that the government should work on behalf of white property owners, not the downtrodden, discriminated, or impoverished. All of this language could you know, conceivably come straight from a modern AM talk show or a right-wing message board in our modern era. To the far right, the fight for political and economic power was a zero-sum game. Roosevelt's New Deal threatened to diminish their privilege by uplifting exploited groups, you know, tenant farmers, factory workers, racial minorities. This was an inversion of the existing hierarchy. And as a result, the far right congealed around the idea of dethroning and unwinding the New Deal order. This origin point at the height of the liberal tide produced one of the far right's guiding principles, which is an uncompromising hatred and distrust of the liberal state. Now, anti-statism itself is a pretty malleable philosophy. It explained and animated the ultra-conservative fears of federal authority, um, their paranoia about communist subversion, their you know, love of states' rights and the free enterprise idea. However, the far right's anti-statism doubled as both a deeply held belief, but also as a cynical and even hypocritical political strategy. On one hand, ultra-conservatives used small government philosophies to demonize you know, liberal opponents depicting expansive programs as unconstitutional or even un-American. Yet, on the other hand, the far right eagerly wielded federal power to disrupt left-wing organizing and liberal governance. If liberalism was a liminal and equally dangerous stage of communism, as the far right believed, then anything was justified to stop it. Thus, state power, when gripped by a firm conservative hand, offered a salve against this existential slippery slope. So despite their anti-status proclamations, far-right conservatives got the chance to wield 
federal power against liberalism um, through the House Un-American Activities Committee, for example. You know, the HUE Act was ostensibly created to investigate domestic fascism during the 1930s, but under Chairman Martin Dyes Jr., HUE Act quickly turned into a hub of anti-communist witch hunting. HUE Act attacked liberalism as a communist plot and brought ultra-conservative conspiracies into the political mainstream. Dyes subpoenaed union members who were involved in the 1937 sit-down strikes. He listened to all manner of wild-eyed conspiracies from uh, from testimony and amassed files on people who were accused of subversion. And the media helped. The media helped amplify these conspiracies too. One New York Times headline claimed the Reds started the sit-down strikes, though the article itself was not based upon any sort of evidence, but instead on the theories of one of HUAC's investigators' wives. Nevertheless, HUAC uh, and their investigations provided a blueprint for using state power to undermine liberalism and left-wing organizing, which is a strategy that would prove even more useful in the coming years during the Cold War. Just a few short years later, as the threat of global communism like vexed the American mind during the 1950s and 60s, the mid-century far-right movement really reached its apex. Cold War America was a, a maelstrom of conspiracy theories and uh, conspiratorial rhetoric. You know, conservatives of all stripes portrayed liberalism as a gateway for, if not outright, state tyranny. And the Cold War fears of communism lent air to the uh, lent legitimacy, an air of legitimacy to the far right and their kind of paranoid um, beliefs. Far right conspiracy theorists believed that communism had already poisoned America's institutions. Uh, Robert Welch, who is the founder of the John Birch Society, told his confidants, and this is his quote, he said, today the process has gone so far that not only our federal government, but some of our state governments are to a disturbing extent controlled by communist sympathizers or political captives of the communists. Senator Joseph McCarthy inherited the investigatory mantle from Dyes and HUAC by continuing to stoke anti-communist hysteria through his own Senate investigations. You know, so the ever-present red menace of the Cold War provided a broad target for far-right conservatives who were looking to undermine any sort of left-wing mobilization. The mid-century civil rights movement also provided a significant catalyst for far-right mobilization. You know, the South always had an authoritarian streak, one that policed the carefully constructed web of segregation. As Margaret Burnham wrote, the system of Jim Crow relied upon the chronic, unpredictable violence that loomed over everyday Black life. The black students who fought against, you know, who fought the uh, the segregation in public schools and universities witnessed this violence firsthand. You know, and nevertheless, civil rights activists sat in, they kneeled, they protested, and ultimately paved the way for incremental civil rights gains. But instead of viewing civil rights as uh, salubrious social progress, far right activists saw it instead as a Trojan horse for social upheaval, you know, and communist subversion. In response, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. In response to Harry Truman, to President Harry Truman's civil rights platform, Alabama Governor Frank Dixon had this to say. This vicious civil rights program means to create a melting pot in the South, to reduce us to the status of a mongrel, inferior race, mixed in blood, our Anglo-Saxon heritage a mockery, to crush with imprisonment our leadership and thereby kill our hopes, our aspirations, our future, and the future of our children. A couple decades later, Kent Courtney, um, a fellow far-right uh, activist, derided Lyndon Johnson's Civil Rights Act as socialist legislation that underscored that the United States was now being communized. Those were his words. So according to the far-right, the communists and their liberal comrades in arms had pushed America to the brink of disaster, whether through civil rights legislation or um, economic leveling. Only a conservative counter-revolution could save the nation. Numerous Far-right organizations answered this call to arms, including groups like the John Birch Society, For America, uh, the Liberty Lobby, the Christian Crusade. There were so, so many. These groups added tens of thousands to their membership roles, and their publications reached the hands of hundreds of thousands during this era. The far-right, as they were, saw the fight against liberalism to them, they, they, called, they saw it as communism, as a civilizational crisis. Welch said that losing this battle would usher in a long and futile dark age after we have been killed, our children have been enslaved, and all that we value has been destroyed. So to combat this perceived communist revolution in progress, the far right hoped to win elections and then wield power, not only to snuff out liberalism, uh, but to enforce conservative beliefs. For example, during the 1960s, an organization existed called the Conservative Society of America, the initials CSA, a not so subtle nod to Southern heritage. Uh, Kent Courtney was the man running the organization, he was a conspiracy theorist who saw communism around every corner, uh, but he was also an incredible grassroots organizer. 
Fortney created a nationwide patchwork of what he called local action units. Essentially, these were groups of motivated ultra conservatives. These guys would engage in mass mailer campaigns, run for local public office. And at first glance, the idea of a local action unit seems like just regular grassroots organizing, democracy. It's the same sort of stuff that DSA and other groups do on an everyday basis. But instead of seeking greater democracy or you know, social justice, Courtney and his group was seeking to repeal progress and to reinforce hierarchies. You know, Courtney viewed local elections as the soft underbelly of American politics, a place where far-right activists could gain a foothold and then pursue conspiratorial, borderline authoritarian outcomes. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples here. Courtney urged the, the action units to swarm local elections and then create what he called, these are his words, a shadow government. He explained this concept in a pamphlet to CSA members, and this is what he said. The office of sheriff has a potential for juvenile education and other activities, which in many cases has not been sufficiently exploited. Just imagine the amount of anti-communist education, which could be carried out by a conservative sheriff who would establish a junior sheriff's posse. That's pretty ominous language and a pretty ominous strategy, considering the modern day effort by far right groups like the Claremont Institute to weaponize local sheriffs as agents of extrajudicial authoritarianism. The far right also targeted schools. One of Courtney's collaborators was a guy named a preacher named Billy James Hargis, and he fretted about dictators, you know, controlling schools and warned that federal aid would lead to more and more brainwashing of children. This is the same sort of McCarthyist thinking that led Turning Point USA in our modern day to create the professor watch list. Um, they actually put me on that watch list after my, the, my book came out, which is a scarlet letter that I wear with pride. Courtney hoped to counter this supposed liberal brainwashing by taking over school boards. You know, he envisioned a school board that would use auditoriums for what he called patriotic gatherings um, and that would compel the adoption of pro-American and anti-communist study courses. It's not hard to compare Courtney's strategies to those of modern politicians, like Ron DeSantis' claim that the AP, that AP courses are full of woke indoctrination or, the, or his state's stop woke bill, which prohibits teachers from discussing race relations in the United States. And so ultimately, the far right sought to win democratic victories only to turn around and undermine democracy itself. Uh, we've seen this most recently with the attempt to overturn the election on January 6, 2021. You know, the Capitol siege failed. Donald Trump is not the president. But conservatives have continued to uh, have continued the far right tradition of undermining democracy, whether through election audits, intense gerrymandering or even outright voter suppression. You know, back in 2018, uh, David Frum, the uh, the famous kind of like never Trump conservative, prophesied that he said, if conservatives become convinced that they cannot win democratically, they will not abandon conservatism. They will reject democracy. And Frum is correct. Conservatives have largely rejected the idea of democracy. But what Frum failed to note is that the, the right-wing authoritarianism we see today draws upon these deep roots that have permeated the entire conservative movement. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, giving us that complex history and uh, laying the groundwork for this discussion. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Nancy McLean. Nancy K. McLean is an American historian. She is the William H. Chafe Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University. McLean's research focuses on race, gender, labor history, and social movements in 20th century U.S. history, with particular attention to the U.S. South. She has received many awards, including, in 2007, the Philip Taft Labor History Book Award of the Labor and Working Class Studies Association, the Alan Sharlin Book Award for the Best Book in Social Science History from the Social Science History Association, and the Labor History Best Book Prize from the International Association of Labor History Institutions. Her books include Democracy in Chains, Behind the Mask of Chivalry, The Making of the Second Ku Klux Klan, and Freedom is Not Enough, The Opening of the American Workplace. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Amy. And I would just add that the, the uh, most recent book that I did that I think is more relevant here that people might have heard of is Democracy and Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America. So I'm really kind of building from that in talking about this, but also in some ways updating it because it came out five years ago and so much has happened since. Um, but it's great to be with you all. John, thank you for starting us off with such interesting material. And uh, I'm also grateful to the organizers for convening this conversation. Uh, 
uh, because the signs grow more ominous daily about the future of this country. Authoritarianism is surging. Nearly half the states of the US are now behind a red curtain, as I think of it, whose officials are using control of state government to throttle democracy, undermine living standards, and take long established freedoms from the people. Fascist rhetoric, tactics, and worldviews are being normalized by the mainstream media that continue to engage in both sidesism. They speak of polarization, when in fact that polarization is a one-sided lurch farther and farther to the right by one of our major parties. Its MAGA core, Make America Great Again core, increasingly exhibits authoritarian leanings, as we see from the former MAGA president himself, but also now a slew of in, uh, imitators, both at the national level and at the state level and, and local level, for that matter. So uh, also with the top leaders of America's coup attempt of January 6, 2021, still unpunished, the right has been emboldened at every level. The rhetoric of today's far right echoes that of classic fascism, as does the educational agenda of Ron DeSantis and others. And in addition to more open advocacy of white supremacy, we're also now witnessing glowing, growing reliance on classic anti-Semitism. One key example, which worked for Viktor Orban in Hungary uh, and is now rampant on the US right, that is trying to copy what Orban achieved uh, in his country by using the rules of democracy to thoroughly undermine uh, democracy, is the depiction of George Soros uh, as a cosmopolitan puppet master or orchestrating the left. That could be straight out of the protocols of the elders of Zion and, and Nazi textbooks. Um, so too, we see the spreading reliance on bullying tactics, including violent administration that no one in the Republican party leadership will call out. So these are dangerous times. They lack the pitch class conflict of the 1920s and the economic depression of the 1930s, but they feature new accelerants that were unknown in that interwar period. Among them, a global corporate radical right that is in increasing dialogue and communication and uh, sharing of strategies and tactics, the capture of once establishment parties, impending climate catastrophe, and craven media moguls, think Fox News, I don't even, why I have to stop saying news, think Fox Network, uh, who prey on white fear and anxiety to spread lies and inflame divisions of all kinds for profit. In fact, in my view, what the combined evidence highlights is that a particular highly ideological section of corporate capital, one that is heavily and not coincidentally based in the fossil fuel sector, is so determined to shackle democracy to achieve their ends that they are starting to experiment with explosive tactics in the way that their counterparts did in Italy in the 1920s and in Germany in the 1930s. We are seeing many donors on the right, among them some of the biggest, as in the case of the Coke network, turning a blind eye to violence used to intimidate uh, opponents and to enable their own securing, their side's uh, securing of control over government. And you can see that in the number of corporations that after January 6th said they would stop funding the Sedition Caucus in Congress and then quietly resumed that funding and they're continuing it now. So for my entry in our conversation tonight, I'm gonna to open with some deep context for comparison. Um, as a historian who has studied the second KKK and interwar fascism, as well as the so-called mainstream conservative movement, which John just showed us, <laughs> has always had a quite radical uh, base. And most recently, um, the Koch network, I thought that bringing those roots to bear would be helpful in setting the stage for Bill Fletcher, who will focus more on our moment and, and and strategy uh, for going forward. So I wanna pull back the lens for a quick look back at elements of the original fascist movements. Uh, but then again, uh, then I'll turn to highlighting some elements of our era that are very different from the interwar years. And in fact, new in history. And I think appreciating both sides, both what is common and echoes the past, but also what is novel is really crucial to meeting the challenge we face. Um, Two reasons I'll share. Uh, one of my fears with using the term fascist to describe what we're seeing is um, 
that it has been used so de- um, loosely for decades now as a synonym for bad, <laughs> that it's been sapped of the galvanizing power that it once had. But my biggest fear with that term is that if it goes into widespread use, I fear we're going to have the syndrome of generals who fight the last war, not the current one, and therefore lose for not having rightly understood the terrain of battle and the attacking forces we see today. So let me start with that quick look back in time. As I said, the parallels are inescapable between classic fascism and some of what we're seeing, not just from the far right on the ground in MAGA, but again, also from uh, national and state level Republican uh, elected officials and and party apparatchiks. Um, Whether by conscious um, strategy or by sick instinct, they are sampling the old toolkit, no question. But, and I think it's a big but that we need to think about, it's also very important to be aware of how different our era is from the one that yielded Mussolini and his black shirts and Hitler and his brown shirts. Then Europe had just emerged from the First World War. That catastrophic mutual devastation set off the Russian Revolution. And after the victory of the Bolsheviks, a global revolutionary workers movement led by the Communist International swept Europe while also giving encouragement and material support to movements for self-determination across the colonized world. The world war further produced an economic crisis, particularly in the defeated Axis nations, that then gave way to a global economic collapse in the 1930s. Also, and especially in the defeated Axis nations, you know, Germany and uh, Italy in particular, uh, and Germany was saddled with taxing reparations that left millions upon millions of former soldiers and military officers unemployed, angry, desperate, and habituated to violence and numb to its human impact. That made these men an ideal target audience for entrepreneurial politicians like Mussolini and Hitler, who saw in them boots for the thug armies they aimed to build, uh, creating new fascist nations from the street up. That, needless to say, is a crude summary, but the point of it is this. Today, we are not in a situation like that, and the distinction matters. So let me just highlight a few key differences. Today in the United States, we have no such pitched economic crisis. To be sure, we have the misery sown by decades of neoliberal austerity uh, policies coming on the heel, you know, or coming on top of uh, generations of uh, institutional racism. Um, But we don't have a collapse akin to that of the 1920s and 30s. And on the contrary, thanks to the lessons from that period, there are measures in place to avert the bottom falling out like it did then. Second, and to my mind, the crucial distinction to be aware of is that our radical right turn is being driven by a, a, from above, again, by a section of capital that is turned against democracy. Most obviously, the network of donors Charles Koch has convened, but others too are now funding literally hundreds of organizations to impose their minority will uh, uh, on the majority. Uh, Just to give you a sense of that, at the national level, they include think tanks like the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation. Uh, They include the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is driving the um, uh, race to the bottom in the states very self-consciously and aggressively, and the Federalist Society, which has captured the Supreme Court and much of the judiciary. So too, the grantees can are, include vast organizing enterprises like Americans for Prosperity, the Libre Initiative, which targets Latino voters, and Generation Opportunity, which seeks to attract and groom young foot soldiers. At the state level, the donor network funds over 150 organizations whose pushing of this race to the bottom is aligned through something called the State Policy Network. You can look it up online and see the affiliates in your state if you're not already aware of them. Uh, And also, the donors have many outposts now in higher education. The Charles Koch Foundation alone underwrites dozens of centers at colleges and universities and is grooming a farm team of grantees to to spread uh, that influence. Influence, uh, and recruit students. Um, so all of this interrelated activity is designed to bring about radical change quietly and uh, 
working within the law to change the law to rig the system and ultimately the constitution in dirty corporations favor. So to achieve that, they've actually managed what classic fascist movements did not. They have fielded the most watched national television network, Fox, to disinform the voters that they need and goad them to see themselves as victims who must become aggressors in self-defense from their alleged attackers. By these combined pincers actions, bottomless bank accounts, hundreds of organizations effectively um, uh, coordinating in a division of labor um, and uh, uh, um, hold on, I kind of lost my, my thought a little bit there. Um, uh, and a media, media ecosystem that has built up a lawyer, loyal viewership larger than any outlets fo uh, following, the radical corporate right has managed, uh, again, to capture one of our two major parties. And they have bent it to their purposes with the carrot of dark money backing and the stick of primary challenges from the right. Think about this, Mussolini and Hitler never managed that. They had to build their own parties. Also crucial and reflective of what is new in our moment, this corporate backed right is not facing a revolutionary challenge from below of a communist and socialist led workers movement looking to win power. Uh, what we face then is an inc increasingly corp uh, authoritarian corporate libertarianism. <laughs> That's a very clunky term, not a feeling. I you know, would be, love to see someone come up with a better uh, version of it. I thought of maybe property supremacy with whips and spurs. I don't know, but, uh, but it, is, it is rather distinctive because the actual specter that our predatory capitalists face uh, is not revolution, but reform. And above all, for fossil fuel megalomaniacs like Koch and his right-wing allies, the driving concern is the threat of international government reform action to stop the climate catastrophe. That poses an existential threat to their profit source and standings, and they, will, they have shown us they, they will do just about anything to stave off that threat from allying with Trump in the United States to allying with Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil to pushing Brexit to undermine the European Union and more. The highly specific nature of this core threatening force of our times is also signaled by the political economic policies their elected allies in the Republican Party pursue as compared to classic fascists. Namely, fascists were statists who used their control of government to provide benefits to their people and to pursue military expansion abroad. Look at the likes of DeSantis, Ted Cruz, and Marco Rubio, to say nothing of the Freedom Caucus in the House. By contrast, it's like neoliberalism on stero steroids, plus efforts to crush uh, civil, li um, civil liberties and, and, and freedoms. So then what we see is some sharp distinctions between the dynamics of classic classic fascism and those of the would-be authoritarian oligarchs of our time. I wanna make this more concrete by outlining briefly before I conclude what I see as the anatomy of today's right wing in the US. Um, as I said, in my reading of the evidence, ultra rich donors are playing a role so core that they should be understood as the brain and the blood supply of the right's anatomy. Predatory capitalists are deliberately and strategically seeking to shackle democracy using multiple strategies uh, and tactics. So our prime actors are not black shirts or brown shirts, if you will, but men in suits who are accustomed to operating internationally and to getting their way. But they know, and this is what I see as the key finding of democracy in chains, they know, uh, and there's strategies take this into account, that the public will never agree to their true agenda. So they fund others to move the agenda piece by interlocking piece with a lot of disinformation uh, and more. Okay, second key element of that anatomy to keep working with this metaphor are the operations these donors fund, the muscle groups, as it were, of the project, the hundreds of groups and campus outposts I mentioned before. The third element is the media they rely on, in effect, the neurological system of this anatomy uh, to disinform the MAGA base and keep it loyal. By cultivating an embattled tribal identity among white Christian Americans in particular, as many researchers have shown, that media activates the reptilian brain. 
Uh, and that makes loyal viewers impervious to rational thinking um, to the point that even where many or most of them agree with Democrats on policy matters, they will vote that fearful identity instead. The fourth element is the limbs uh, the strategists rely on to get where they want to go. The Republican Party they've captured and bent to their purposes. Uh, and the fifth element is the largest numerically, the base they enlist as a battering ram. White Christian nationalists make up the core of that base, having been, uh, of that fist rather, um, having been convinced that they are losing their God-given country to infidels of various stripes. But finally, and this is also important, that fist is mailed. If you remember the ancient kind of armor uh, that uh, medieval and other armies would use, and its outward casing comes from the least numerous, yet armed, active, and highly dangerous accelerate uh, forces. The Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Buglo Boys, the Constitutional Sheriffs, as they call themselves, and the like. So what is this combined anatomy now doing? Uh, systematically disrupting and seeking to remake institutions previously beyond their control that might prevent their victory. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna uh, dig into any of the particulars, but I will just flag some, and if people wanna uh, raise questions in the discussion, they can. Obviously, the Republican Party, which has been thoroughly remade in its congressional uh, delegation, both in the House and Senate since, in, since 2010 election administration. The intimidation, continuing harassment from Trump's big lie has, has driven so many people out of election administration from both parties, and that could be the greatest toll of January 6th. Uh, public health, as we saw with the pandemic, has been subject to unbelievable uh, attacks and intimidation so that many people are leaving that field and nursing. Public education. Um, again, libertarians cannot abide the idea of public education. So what we're seeing now from the likes of DeSantis uh, is building on previous efforts to privatize uh, education, but using weaponizing um, racism and uh, hostility to trans people and homophobia um, to do that. Finally, there's one more institution that the combined forces of the radical right are making a play to disrupt and repurpose that we need to be very aware of, the military. Uh, I, again, in the interest of time and I wanna get to Bill, I'm not gonna say as much about that, except to say the, the um, white power groups, the Christian nationalists and the Koch network have been focusing on the military um, in, in ways that we can talk about. Um, and there are people within the military saying if this continues and there are no prosecutions of January 6th, it's quite possible that the military could split in 2024 with a Trumpian outsider uh, being able to command significant forces within the military and cause a civil war like situation. Okay, uh, so what does all of this tell us? That getting the diagnosis and treatment plan right is literally going to be, in many cases, a matter of life and death. Um, it is no longer deniable that we face a growing authoritarian threat in America, um, but this threat is distinctive in many ways from things that we have seen before. But here's something else to keep in mind, and I'll just uh, say this and wrapping up before handing it over to, uh, to my friend Bill. Um, we also have some resources <laughs> that anti-fascists of the 1930s lacked and that can enable us to defeat this threat as they could not. And I think it's very important to be aware of those, of the kind of tailwinds that we have on our side. Um, above all, we have a vast, broad, and now intersectional left, um, and I use that term, you know, inclusively and, and broadly, but that is now rowing together like never before um, in my, my lifetime, and it's seeing this authoritarian threat. Um, it has also shown the ability to set the agenda for a Democratic president and Congress in a manner not seen for half a century, even though Biden is now seeming to walk away from a lot of that. You know, initially it was it was a surprisingly uh, progressive agenda. And I think this is in part because we have brilliant Black, Latino, Asian American, female and queer leaders who understand well the need for a fusion politics to get us through. And they have proved that they can win over whites, men, straights and establishment fixture, figures with fusion messaging and, a, and determined grassroots organizing. We also have a generation coming up that is the most diverse, inclusive, and progressive in our history. 
And finally, because precisely because we don't face the cataclysmic economic and social conditions that pr produce the original fascism, we have a bit of breathing room, not much, but some, uh, to hone our strategy and make the alliances needed over the next few years. And that means we can use this current crisis uh, to renew democracy, to meet the fierce challenges of our time, and to create a better world before it is too late. As the Gen Z activists remind us, there is no planet B. Thank you. Take it away, Fletch. Thank you, Thank you so much, Nancy. Yes, I will uh, do just a, a brief uh, introduction of Bill Flesher before I hand you the mic. Um, but thank you so much for um, that, uh, uh, providing that uh, historical and international uh, context, and also for this, the locating um, this idea of a new kind of fascism and you know locating that within global corporate capital. Thank you so much. Um, now our final speaker tonight is Bill Fletcher. Over the years, Bill Fletcher has been active in workplace and community struggles as well as electoral campaigns. He has worked for several labor unions in addition to serving as a senior staff person in the national AFL-CIO. Fletcher is the former president of Trans Africa Forum, a senior scholar with the Institute for Policy Studies, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, and in the leadership of several other projects. Fletcher is the co-author with Peter Agard of the Indispensable Ally, Black Workers and the Formation of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, 1934 to 1941, the co-author with Dr. Fernando Gapasson of Solidarity Divided, The Crisis in Organized Labor and a New Path Towards Social Justice, and the author of They're Bankrupting Us and 20 Other Myths About Unions. Fletcher is a syndicated columnist and a regular media commentary, commentator on television, radio, and the web. So please take it away, Bill Fletcher. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Amy. And Doug, uh, good evening to everyone. And my thanks to my fellow panelists. Uh, so let's consider what we've just heard. Uh, two points immediately come to mind. In order to really summarize the objective of the far right, it's very simple, to overthrow the 20th century. And uh, that is what unites the far right. Uh, there are many divisions among them that are significant, but overarching, that's what it is. And I refer to it, along with other uh, friends, as a new confederacy. Uh, the second thing uh, also draws from something that Nancy was raising. And in listening to her, I was reminded of a story that Lukács tells in his uh, short but very interesting book, Lenin. And he, he tells about a meeting that took place in 1920 after the Kaputsch in Germany. And that was a, an attempted military coup. And the German communists went to Moscow to meet with Lenin and to talk what about what happened. And they gave this sort of exhaustive analysis. And at the end they said, and the next time that the German right tries this, we'll be ready. And Lenin, after having not said anything, looks at them and says, what makes you think that the German right will repeat the same approach that they took in the Cap Putsch? And I think that that's one of the things that's important about what uh, has been raised already, that we should not be looking to the 20s and 30s and early 40s um, we, we should look there to get some idea of elements of the far right, and particularly 20th century fascism. But we have to understand what is new, what's different. And I think that uh, Jonathan and, and Nancy uh, raised that, so I want to applaud that. Um, so a few basic points in terms of beginning to think about how we need to mount a strategic response. One is um, to emphasize that the right is not a monolithic force, it never has been. There are multiple tendencies within the right. Some of them uh, despise one another, just like um, uh, people like Richard Vigory despised Richard Nixon in the late 1960s, but they were able to figure out ways of, of collaborating. And so you have that. Um, a second thing is that the Republican Party has become a party for dictatorship. It is, it's not just a consolidated right-wing party. 
It's a party that has come to accept the idea of dictatorship as a legitimate uh, uh, direction. Um, and what they would probably think of as, I forgot there was a name that Pinochet used for Chile, the Iron Democracy, I think it was. Um, but I think that, that their vision of the future is along those lines, an authoritarian democracy, meaning uh, a system where you have the pretense of democracy in elections, but there's no real, no reality to them. Um, a second thing that many people on the left do not discuss when it comes to the right is that both uh, in uh, fascism of the 20s and 30s, but also now, two things really are, are interesting. One is that uh, fascism was not the monolithic unity of the capitalist class against the working class and other popular classes. It was just as much in some cases an intra-capitalist intra fight. And this becomes very, very important in terms of the way we look at the current situation, that there is an intra-capitalist fight that's underway um, and, and they've personified, the right has personified the enemy in the form of people like George Soros, which works out in terms of anti-Semitism, obviously, but they're, they're trying to indicate that, that there is this distinction within the capitalist class. And so this fight from the far right is both against elements within the, uh, the capitalist class, as well as against popular classes. It's a fight. Uh, that uh, within the capitalist class that really is aiming to eliminate constitutional democracy, democratic capitalism, and advance the interests, particularly of uh, fossil uh, segments of capital, real estate, and some elements of finance. Um, now, with that in mind, uh, what are some of the conclusions that we should think about in terms of going forward? Because one of the big dangers in these discussions is the danger that you see in some responses to the climate crisis, which is hopelessness, that there's nothing that we can do. Uh, might as well just pull out the herb, get really high, and just try to coast, because there's nothing we can do. And that is what our opponents would like us to believe. But there actually are ways of stopping this. There's nothing particularly inevitable about uh, any victory on the part of the right. Strategically, we need to be thinking at the level of what I've been calling B4, a broad front opposing the right. That is, we need to understand that this is not a fight that is only the working class against capitalists. It's not a fight only of the left uh, against the far right. It's, it's a fight that has to entertain an engagement with all those who are prepared to oppose the far right. Now, I can already hear it that some people are saying, oh my God, class collaboration, Fletcher, and people arguing that we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for neoliberalism. Well, maybe we wouldn't, who knows? Uh, but the point is we are here. So the question then is who is it that has an interest, an objective interest in opposing the far right? Those are the forces that we have to figure out ways of aligning with, at least tactically and in other cases, strategically. Now, this will be very difficult for much, much of the left because we're used to, um, uh, Freud called it the narcissism of small differences, of minor differences. And um, I stumbled across that in Kim Stanley Robinson's brilliant book, uh, The Ministry of the Future. But it turns out that it is a concept that Freud elaborated, which really does describe much of the left, that we are prepared to fight it out to the knife over minor differences and can't figure out how to build upon those areas of, of strong unity that we have. In order to defeat the, the right, we on the left are gonna to have to identify what are the issues around which we must unite in order to function in a very cooperative, and I don't mean that moralistically, but in a, in a practical, in a cooperative way. And the second thing is, how do we identify people that may not be within the left at all? There may even be some elements of the right that nevertheless are in open opposition to uh, the far right. 
Now, this is not, not unprecedented. During World War II, for example, in some of the very successful work in play, uh, uh, led by the left against fascists, like in, uh, in Yugoslavia and some other places, there was a willingness to unite with forces that were not particularly radical, but were in opposition to fascists. The, the real trick is to understand that we have these immediate interests and they may not last very long. So you always have to be operating with your third eye open. But while the basis exists in order to collaborate against our principal enemy, you go forth and you do that. So we need the notion of a broad front opposing the right. In thinking about that, we, I would argue we draw from lessons that were elaborated by the architects of the new right in the late 60s and early 70s. And one of the things that they brilliantly uh, did was to operate on multiple levels, the political and legislative, uh, the areas of litigation and area of mass movements. And one thing that they did far superior to us is that they did not make preconditions for people participating in one or another area, or when it came to mass movements, in, in participating in different mass movements that might have been right wing, but there was no uh, bar that people had to jump over other than agreement around those issues. Now, we on the left, we offer a different uh, approach to these things. We are uh, constantly trying to raise the bar to make it more and more difficult for people to enter into struggle and to engage our enemies, more and more difficult. We'll always come up with greater differences in order to keep people out and to demonstrate how pure we are. And we'll remember that when we're marching off to the camps, how pure we are. And, and so one of the things we have to think about in a very different way then is building this broad front, understanding that there'll be strategic allies and tactical allies that will be operating on multiple levels. So for instance, um, in, the, in Florida, uh, one of the things that I have wondered about is um, we're not going to defeat DeSantis on the basis of weekend rallies. Um, demonstrations are going to be very important. But let's think differently. In order to defeat an, uh, an opponent, one of the things you do is you aim to defeat their strategy. So if DeSantis, DeSantis pushed through this legislation around so-called critical race theory, in essence saying that you cannot teach students anything that's going to make them feel guilty or make them feel uh, unsettled. Why don't we, progressives, launch a class action led particularly by Black parents in Florida that challenges US history as something that constantly makes us feel bad, that constantly makes us feel less than we are? that constantly ignores us from history. Let's use DeSantis's own language and law and kick his ass. See, we've got to think differently about how to approach this. Now, there will be people that would be interested probably in engaging that who are litigators. They may not be mass movement people. So what? Engage them, right? Bring them in. Make them feel part of this movement. They have to be part of the movement. That was one of the beauties of the, uh, the civil rights phase of the Black Freedom Movement, where there were multiple means for people to engage, whether they were lawyers, whether they were street fighters, whatever they were, we've got to be doing the same thing. Or people that may not want to be involved in electoral politics. There's plenty of stuff to do. For example, the next time these fascists show up at school committee meetings, instead of us firing off tweets and text messages, complaining about how horrible the situation is, why don't we show up and triple the numbers? Why don't we just show up? I mean, there was this interesting story uh, you may have seen, uh, uh, and I'm taking a risk in telling the story, but it was a, a couple of years ago in Texas that some fascist group decided that they were going to uh, do a, an armed protest in front of a mosque. And unfortunately for them, there were armed African-Americans that showed up at the same rally. And all of a sudden, these armed fascists 
decided that they had something else to do, maybe wash the car, clean the house, something, and they left. You see, one of the things, these are bullies. And what we have to do is we have to respond to the bullies. We have to utilize self-defense, and I'm not going to elaborate any more on that. But we also have to, most importantly, be there in numbers. And, and so when abortion clinics are being attacked, we have to be there. When there is that threat to women, we've got to be there. When there are school committee efforts, we've got to be there. And, and so it's that organizing that mass base and getting people engaged, getting our union members involved getting people in tenants groups, getting other folks involved. And if they, if, if you know, uh, for some of the senior elements, I think about my mother, who's 95 years old, who is, you know, constantly at a very progressive and saying that she wished she could do more. I said, mom, just write a check. Just write a check and don't feel bad about that because the movement needs the resources. You see, we've got to be thinking in a very different way. In fact, we've got to be thinking like winners instead of as victims. I'm sick of victims. I didn't sign up with this to be a victim. I didn't sign up with this to be a loser. I signed up to win. We have to defeat the other side. Now, one other piece, and then I'm going to shut up. The defense of the status quo cannot be our basis of unity. The status quo is certainly better than fascism. But that's not what's going to mobilize people. That's the problem, that, that when we think about defeating the right, it's not simply putting up a picture of Donald Trump or DeSantis and throwing darts at them, right? It's not just saying, oh, my God, if you don't vote for us, you're going to get this, even though that scares the bejeebies out of me, and I'm ready to vote. But the point is, that that's not enough. We've got to be thinking in a different way, and that is towards offering an alternative and this is where the role of the left becomes very important. Not some pie in the sky alternative. I mean, a fight for governing power here and now. What does it look like to take over cities and counties and states? How do we break out of state preemption, which is what's destroying the city of Jackson, Mississippi, have been used to destroy Gary, Indiana, used to, to weaken and destroy Detroit? How do we do that? Well, we have to have a different kind of strategy. And we've got to be thinking at a different level. We've got to be thinking about an alternative set of economics and politics. And that becomes the call, you know, the call that we articulate in the fight. So it's not just a fight of resistance. It is that. But it's also a fight to advance a different vision. Now, as socialists, ultimately, we want something that transcends capitalism. But unfortunately, but here's, here's the dilemma, you know, and I see this in the environmental movement as well. If all we say is that the solution to the environmental crisis is socialism, that presents some major problems. Like, well, how do we get from where we are now, where the planet is dying, until, to there? And how do we help people understand that capitalist, democratic capitalism can be reformed up to only a certain point? And that past that point, something fundamental, fundamentally different is necessary. It's by engaging people in real world struggles in a fight to transform their lives. That's what we need to do. I would argue DSA needs to be an advocate for B4. It needs to join with others and say, that's what we need. We need B4. We're gonna work with others on the left. We're not gonna be just looking at our navel. We're not just gonna be priding ourselves on our numbers. We're going to be embracing other forces on the left because that will be the only way that we'll be able to build a significant enough core in order to build a broad enough front. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you can all see the reactions on Zoom. There are hearts and clapping hands. And so thank you so much for that. Um, uh, wonderful. I can't wait to um, to to get into some some discussion now. Um, we've got some questions that have come up, so um, I'm going to ahead and just uh, we've asked people to address them to particular presenters. So I'm going to start with. Uh, so we might be going back and then moving forward a little bit. So um, I'm going to start with our first question that we have here. 
Um, this is for John Huntington. This is from uh, Alexander Gorlick. Uh, can, John, can John Huntington address if he thinks that or if certain strains of Protestant Christianity, particularly figures like Robert Schuller from Los Angeles in the 1930s, contributed to this history? Um, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the fundamentalist movement, the evangelical movements of the 30s, 40s, 50s all contributed, you know, to this. There's there's a lot of great books on this. Um, one of my favorites is Darren Dochuk's uh, book from Bible Belt to Sun Belt, which, you know, details kind of how conservative uh, fundamentalists brought their Christianity from the deep south over to California and kind of built um, these these very uh, right wing movements. Um, yeah, and I think it's not just Protestants either. You know, look at uh, Catholic priests like Father Coughlin, who had a really right-wing radio show, was an anti-Semite in the 1930s. You know, and all of these guys um, very much contribute to the, uh, you know, the apocalyptic uh, kind of paranoia that represents the far right. You know, I mean, there was you know, the antagonism towards uh, ecumenicalism, the 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 idea that you know, why focus on earthly goods when, you know, when heaven awaits sort of thing. And so absolutely, I think that um, that the Protestant Christianity, particularly the fundamentalist uh, and, and evangelical groups that existed uh, during the 50s and 60s, and even earlier, uh, play, play a key role in this. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm going to let everyone know too that I'm going to take these, I might be taking questions a little bit out of order to kind of maybe group them or theme them if I can. Um, but uh, I, I want to go next to um, this question from Allison Chang, who asks, would Professor McLean speak more about, oh, we're just keeping it uh, some Christianity questions here. Uh, could Professor McLean speak more about the role of Christian nationalism in the far right? It seems this group is very successful in using the media to normalize extremism, largely by claiming with no pushback that their anti-democratic goals and overt bigotry are innocent expressions of, quote, sincere belief. Yeah, um, the Christian nationalists are really, and when we say that, I think we're really essentially, oh, oh, talking about white evangelical, um, uh, uh, white evangelicals, and to some extent, um, conservative Catholics, but the white evangelical presence has been really strong and doesn't have any countervailing tendencies, like, you know, the Catholics have a social justice tradition and, you know, some support for unions. And so I think, you know, could maybe somehow be a weak link. Certainly Pope Francis is encouraging uh, in that regard. But, um, you know, you can take this story way back, right, to like the Scopes trial and the early 20th century. So there was a whole reaction among um, uh, white evangelical conservatives kind of against um, modernity, against a lot of things that were happening in, in education uh, in particular. Um, and they started building up their own counter institutions and their own kind of closed culture for a very long time that then became public um, in the 1970s. But something that we've seen since the 1970s is the fusion of the top on entrepreneurial religious leaders uh, of that 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 constituency with the billionaire right you know and there's other people who have written about this Ann Nelson has a very good book about called the shadow network about the um, uh, Council for national policy and she shows very concretely how they come together and reinforce one another and also operate through the likes of Salem broadcasting which now reaches one in five radio listeners um you know they're, they're kind of omnipresent uh, out there so it's really really a significant issue and they're the key most reliable constituents for the Republican Party now, and the most reliable uh, Fox viewers, uh, and the strongest supporters of MAGA. So it's going to be, I think, a very hard nut to crack, and I'm not even sure that that's where efforts should start, although it would be wonderful to find ways to open things up a little bit. But I think, you know, one of the things that they've done tremendously effectively, um, going back to uh, Bill Fletcher's point about uh, litigation is to ally on the question of religious liberty. And the only liberty in question is really the liberty to dominate people, as in school prayer, or the liberty to discriminate against people. Um, so, uh, but that is happening in a very big way as the Koch Network and others, you know, who originate on the Christian right, fund groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, which actually operates transnationally to stir up homophobia and transphobia 
Serbia in order to build up base voters for reactionary populism. Uh, so um, yeah, I think it's a really important question and really important for, for people to know about. And also um, to know the history, there's a, a great book by um, Anthea Butler, um, a, a theologian about the 19th century roots of this white evangelical Christian nationalism in the slaveholders denominations of um, various evangelical denominations. So um, it's, it's a huge issue that needs to be solved. And uh, I'm glad that uh, I think it was Allison, was it? Or no, it was, who was it that raised it? Where'd she go? Anyway, thank yes, you. It was Allison Chang, yes. Oh, it was Allison, okay, good. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I'm gonna yeah, try to divide the, the questions up between some of our, our panelists. So I'm gonna go to Bill next. This is from Aiden Bissell Siders. Uh, Hi, Bill, I strongly agree with your argument that socialists must work with, quote, all those prepared to oppose the far right. Which groups do you think are doing the best work and most deserve socialist cooperation in, in this progressive front? Mm. That's an interesting question on multiple levels. So I think that there are some forces in DSA that get it and some that are also trapped in purism that don't get it. Um, there's groups like Liberation Road and Left Roots uh, among the socialist left. There's um, then you have forces in the broader progressive social movements, uh, some of whom I think are getting it. And I'm, I'm thinking in, in the trade union movement, uh, you have unions like National Nurses United, American Postal Workers Union, um, and some others that, uh, SEIU, that get it um, and the importance of this. Um, there are groups like the Working Families Party. Uh, there are statewide organizations like New Virginia Majority, Florida Rising. Um, the problem is that we're less than the sum of our parts. Mm -hmm. And, and, we, we, it, and there's very few people that are putting out the call for a, a political and organizational reconfiguration. Um, and uh, Bill Gallegos uh, from Los Angeles and I wrote a piece in The Nation a few months ago that talked about something called mountain stronghold mentality. And I just want to reiterate this point. The term comes from something that Mao Zedong used during the Chinese Revolution to describe a phenomena where during the guerrilla wars, you'd have bases that were on tops of mountains and they were very secure. And at night, the, troop, the guerrillas would come out, attack the Guomantan, then retreat back to the base. Everything was cool. But at a certain point, the nature of warfare needed to change. And the troops needed to come out of those mountain strongholds and form mobile units that would fight in a different way. And many of the guerrilla, guerrilla commanders refused because they were comfortable and safe in their mountain strongholds. They didn't want to change. That's part of the problem in left and progressive circles. Too many of us are comfortable in our particular organizations uh, with our funding sources, maybe with, the, with our brand, right? And, and the idea of a reconfiguration is really scary because it, among other things, means you're gonna be with people you may not like, you may not know, you have to operate differently, you can't impose the same organizational culture that you might've been used to, this is scary. We're actually building a new army. And, and so I, my challenge to progressives is to get out of the mountain stronghold because ultimately if we don't, we'll get swamped. That's the bottom line. And so the, there's good work that's out there, but I'm just saying it's not enough and it's not appreciating uh, to bar borrow from Malcolm X. We're running out of time. Thank you so much for that uh, response. Um, I'm uh, gonna go, 
I'm going to go back to, uh, I'm, yeah, just trying to, <laughs> trying to, uh, Put these together in some some order but uh this might be we might be moving around a little bit um i we have a question here about um uh this is from mark schaefer uh i'm, I'm not sure who wants to take this one um possibly nancy because you talked about uh fox network not news um that we're in mark writes we're in an asymmetric struggle with the hard right which is funded by multiple billionaires but their policies are harmful to the vast majority how can we build a progressive communication slash, slash mobilization system with com with comparable reach to murdoch sinclair at all to, to reach uh the same kinds of millions of people daily yeah i think i would um take that question from an oblique angle and say it's important to remember why they need all of this on the other side because they know that their policies are unpopular they know that you know that they're not going to win people to a lot of what we need and so i'm not sure trying to create some kind of huge media conglomerate would do it i mean i remember in the early days of right-wing talk radio there was you know an attempt to form a left-wing version of that air america you know part of the problem is like the likes of us like we we have shit to do. Like, I don't want to sit and listen to somebody yelling at me all day, right? Like, I know what the problems are. Like, there was a tribal thing going on on the right that the left doesn't seem to want in the same way. And partly because, you know, people who are not on the far right sample a whole range of media. So I, my personal feeling is that that's not so much the need now. I mean, I think we could work either what, what what we do need is a huge program of popular education, of listening to communities, but also bringing knowledge about the scale of the threat that we're facing, about different ways to fight it, you know, about groups that are involved in that struggle. And so I would approach this in a different way and, and, and um, in keeping with what Bill was saying, which I 100% agree with, that, you know, I think the purity politics on the left, quite frankly, as a historian, I think it's the unacknowledged debt to Puritan America, right? Right? And there's a way that Protestantism has been secularized and so many on the left want to prove their bona fides. I am more righteous than you because I will say all of these nouns and adjectives in a sentence um, that may not play anywhere else in the country, but you will know that I am I am righteous, right? And that's that's going to kill us. It's totally going to kill us um, because we are living in a geographically based political system for one thing, um, a federalist system where you know the left is concentrated in very few places, and if we aren't getting out to those red states and you know challenging what's going on there, we're not going to make it. Um, so rather than think about trying to construct a whole new media uh, system, I would say the more immediate task is to uh, find people where they are. You know, as Bill was saying, um, it, it, what Bill said reminded me of a great um, a, a great piece by um, Bernice Johnson Reagan, who was part of the Albany Freedom Movement and then Sweet Honey in the Rock, the acapella group. But she wrote this great piece about coalition building back in the 1980s. But she said, stretch your perimeter. If you're not feeling the strain, you're not doing the work, right? So if everybody, you know, on this call or would think of all the networks that they're connected to, you know, um, whether it's personal or the church or school or, you know, community center or places that you could make a relationship with, you know, and start trying to engage people in these kinds of conversations and, and public education, uh, that that would go a long way, right? And knitting, you know, the bridges that need to be built locally and at the state level uh, with different groups around the kind of agenda that Bill is talking about. I, I think that's much more the need because there are, you know, I think a majority of people agrees with us. I mean, we saw that in the huge turnout in 2020 and the, you know, and, and people, it was an anti-fascist vote really mm -hmm. um, that Biden was the beneficiary of, but those, nobody's telling those people what to do. Every day, each one of us gets up to hundreds of, excuse me, fucking fundraising emails. Not a single one says, what can you do? What should you do? Where should you be? How can you help, right? So I think we that's what, that's what needs to be doing. As Bill said, everywhere these bullies are, there should be a very um, calm, deliberate, presence that will speak well to those watching, but we should we should outnumber them everywhere and um, and use a kind of jujitsu. They want to be bullies. Well, we're going to show the public just what bullies they are by being present with cameras, as has happened with um, uh, police murders of, of African-Americans. I mean, having that footage, um, you know, if you think of the case of George Floyd has, you know, it's it's 
transformative. Um, so I, I would argue for more kind of grassroots media and outreach and public education. Amy, can I just add something? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I love what Nancy was just saying. I um, see we, the oppressed never have more resources than the oppressor, mm -hmm. never in history. I mean, just, I mean, just think about it, right? And, and so the reality is that we're fighting an asymmetric struggle. And the, 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 the difficulty for many people is that they see something like Fox and they say, well, we want our own Fox. Well, we're not gonna get it. Or this, this, this billionaire that gave a billion dollars to the Federalist Society. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wish that there was a progressive capitalist out there that would give us a billion dollars. That's not gonna happen. Nor is there an invisible socialist country in the Atlantic that's going to ship us gold. It ain't going to happen. So, the, so that means that we have to think very differently than our opponents. There are lessons that we can learn. And I really think very important lessons from the beginning, early years of the far of the new right in the late 60s, early 70s. But we're going to be operating in a very different way. Um, we do not have the institutions that they do. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't win and we can't defeat them tactically either. We, we have, but we have to think in a different way. So that begins with this question of vision and organization. Can I, can I also hop in real quick? I, I, I want to piggyback off the idea of, of getting past the purity test. And I think that's, I think that's really important here. And the way that I think we could do this to, to like build a movement, you know, if we can't go from the top down because we don't have the resources, as, as Bill just noted, you know, you start from the local level. This is how the far right got their start, right? They targeted local elections where there's very little turnout. They got people on the school boards and on the local councils and then started building from there. And, you know, what's funny is that they actually use left wing organizing techniques. The John Birch Society was literally modeled after the old Communist Party USA. And, you know, if we could start by targeting locally, you know, you get a foothold and then you're able to build. And I, and I agree as with Bill and Nancy both that um, getting past the purity test is really important because that's how the conservatives won their elections. They were able to find a way to get the far right and the pragmatic or kind of like mainstream right, so to speak, to talk to each other. And then they started winning because they formed a coalition, whereas the left as of recent has been really, in my lifetime at least, has been really good at forming, you know, circular firing squads. And that's about it. Thank you, everyone. This is a great discussion. Um, I've, I've got, I'm, yeah, on that note, I want to do do a question for John and then back to, to Bill um, with another one. But uh, to start with for John, um, uh, this is from uh, Jonah. This is, uh, John talked a lot about groups like the Jeffersonian Democrats and the John Birch Society, as you just mentioned, perhaps analogous to today's alt-light, but less on more radical mass organizations like the Silver Shirts, Father Coughlin's Christian Front and the Third Clan and American Nazi Party active during the same historical eras. What do you, what do you see as the relationship between between these two wings of the far right, particularly as it relates to your characterization of the far right as the vanguard of conservatism. Yeah, I mean, I think they're collaborative. Uh, the a lot of the guys like the Birchers, um, you know, the Jeffersonians didn't want to encourage the 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 violent radicals, you know, and I would include you know, like the Minutemen and those types of more more radical and extreme groups in that category. They didn't want to be perceived as violent because they thought that would ruin their uh, image publicly, but they didn't mind working with them. You know, they were fine if those guys sat in on their meetings. They didn't have a problem networking with those guys. You know, I mean, the the, the Citizens Council and the Klan, the real big difference was the violence, right? The, but the Citizens Council sought the same sort of ends just through different means. You know, and so and it's not that they were willing to talk to Klansmen. To me, those are that it's the it's just a different side of the same coin. You know, and, and these guys did collaborate. You know, they worked together because they had the same end goal of maintaining kind of a conservative authoritarian regime in the South. And, and so uh, to me, I think they I, I think it's all part of the same network. It's just a different way of getting at uh, what they view as a as a similar problem. Thank you for that. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I, great. I want to uh, go back to. Um, to Bill and kind of combine a couple of questions here, if that's OK. Um, 
Well, we've got a, a question from John Woodward that says, how might the panel square um, Fletcher's encouragement of wider alliance building um, with uh, Nancy McLean's warning of factionalism within the military? Um, but And also combine that with this idea of uh, Miriam Benzman asks about uh, calling for uniting against fascism. Uh, to what extent does that mean cooperating at times with centrists and capitalists? So again, you know, who are we working with? and and does that make does that Bill, make sense? can I just jump in on a, uh, for a sec on this question mm -hmm. of the military? Because I don't see those two things as being counterposed in the way that the question poses them. I think mm -hmm. the kind of broad alliance building um, that Bill was talking about will also be helpful uh, in the military. But I think, you know, on the military question, I think we have to realize that we, you know, the left is used to you know, going back to Bill's point about getting out of, of uh, habits that are destructive in this moment, the left, and I'm as guilty as anyone, um, has a history of thinking of the military as, you know, the whole thing as like enforcing an imperialist presence and, you know, doing things that nobody would approve of. Um, but I think, you know, in the spirit of what Bill was saying about recognizing significant distinctions, you know, among capitalists and in other places, we've also got to do that with the, the military, because the right right now is trying to depose the actual nonpartisan military leadership committed to the Constitution, right? And that would include people like, you know, blow me away with a feather, General Mark Milley, who criticized Trump, did what he could to quietly avert the coup, and then said publicly that the military has a white supremacy uh, problem it needs to deal with. And that's why he wants to know about CRT and DEI efforts. So, um, so, you know, I think that is still probably the majority of the military leadership. And obviously, they're committed to the empire and everything else. But but if they're also committed to the Constitution in this moment, that's really important. Um, and so, uh, so that's what I'd say. But I think, you know, these are two different terrains and I don't I don't see any conflict between building broad alliances and trying to be aware of those divisions uh, and ways in which we could perhaps be part of helping to marginalize the people who are trying to create a truly rogue uh, uh, military. Um, I, I would encourage everybody to watch Seven Days in May, uh, a brilliant movie Rod Serling, famous for The Twilight Zone, wrote the screenplay. Um, it's about um, a coup attempt. And it was, um, it, it was, it was, uh, came out in the early 60s. And it was actually at a point when John Kennedy thought that there could be a coup against him by elements of the military. Um, and it's interesting because you're looking at these contradictions within an institution that many of us will never get close to. And, and so it's the notion for us of exploiting contradictions that becomes very, very important. Um, a second point is we need to organize veterans. We need to be much better and we need to support the work of those who have, uh, Veterans for Peace, even though I don't agree with them on the issue of the Russell Ukrainian war. Um, I think that they've done a really important job, Iraqi war veterans, et cetera. There needs to be an anti-fascist veterans formation. Um, you know, if you don't organize veterans, veterans will be organized by the right. It's just history just demonstrates it time and again. And, and so we need to be, we need to have an approach that reaches out there. Um, the third thing I want to say is in, in terms of the question specifically about uniting with centrists, um, you unite with whoever you un need to unite with in order to defeat our main enemy. Um, and, and so there will be unities that will have the centrist Democrats around certain things, um, you know, uh, around civil liberties and a number of other things. But there will be big differences. There will, in fact, be strategic differences. And we shouldn't cover over those. Um, we should recognize that in some states, the struggle will not be principally against the far right. It will be against centrists, Democrats who might be holding power in a particular city, county, or state. But at a national level, we're building a front against the neo-Confederate forces. 
And we can't ever lose sight of that, never lose sight of what the balance of forces looks like right now, because otherwise we will be going sideways. Now, one of the things about liberals um, that we have to keep in mind is that liberals are scared to death of the left. And, and that there is a propensity for liberals to believe that the institutions of, demo of bourgeois democracy will be self-correcting. And this is what they really want to believe, that, that the institutions will always make sure that the, right, the far right remains, remains at the fringe. And you could see this in, in Italy and in Germany in the 20s and 30s. You see it periodically in the United States. And we have to be the ones that always say that uh, there, there is no pendulum. There is no institution that's impervious to the, uh, the attack of the far right or being influenced by the far right. Case in point, the Supreme Court. Um, and, and so, but we have to understand this is who liberals are. So we shouldn't attack liberals for being liberals. We should understand who they are, what their limitations are, and where we can unite with them, let us unite with them against a common opponent, but never losing sight that we have strategic differences. Yeah, real, real briefly, I want to say, like touching on the military stuff that you both have been talking about, I think you're both right. And we often, I think on the left, have a tendency to kind of like homogenize the military as like entirely run through with conservative actors and thinkers. But I know a lot of veterans and they're left leaning, like maybe not leftists, but they might operate as like liberals, you know, and and they're mad, like, you know, the VA doesn't treat them well, they, you know, they struggle to get their benefits. And I, I think that's a real opportunity is to reach out to veterans, you know, that might be kind of moderate, even even liberal leaning and, and try to organize them. I think that's a really key opportunity. I agree with both of y'all. I, I am so sorry to say that we have reached, we're out of time. I apologize if we did not get to your question, but thank you all for, um, for sending in your thoughts. Um, I just want to give one more uh, final thank you to our amazing panelists. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I want to remind everyone that um, I believe that um, David has put some links to most recent books from our panelists in the in the chat for people to see. So please check those out to to read and learn more from our wonderful guests. And I, I want to remind everyone that this is also this has been recorded and will be available on uh, NPEC's uh, YouTube channel. So please uh, look for that. I'm not exactly when it will be up, but it will be. Um, and uh, you know, encourage you to attend uh, further events for this kind of, of discussion. And again, finally, one more uh, final thank you to all of our all of our panelists. Thank you so much.